That's not fair. It's a phrase I've heard multiple times over the years in my household, whether it's the amount of dessert being served or the designated bedtime for a particular young lady. You've probably heard something similar in your house, and you may have responded with something like, well, life's not fair. That exemplifies the emotion that we'll see in today's psalm. You see, God has created us with an innate sense of right and wrong. And when that little voice inside of us thinks that we've been mistreated, it comes out. I mean, look out, we respond and cry out for justice. Today we're going to see how sin in the world causes us to cry out, that's not fair. And maybe even calls us to see our need for salvation. If you remember, we're tracing the gospel story through the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms here and there, and we're doing it in terms of emotions, not necessarily just doctrine of salvation. We want to see the emotional side. We want to see the thrill of salvation. So far, we've seen awe and wonder in a praise psalm as we recognize the majesty of God and see God for who He is. Last week, we saw sadness in a lament psalm as we see that the world just isn't as it should be. Well, today we're going to look at what is called an imprecatory psalm. Anger and frustration, crying out to God for justice. Let me say a word of prayer to open us up, and then Mike McRae will be reading Psalm 10 for us. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would continue to teach us from your word today. And what we're asking for is not just doctrine to fill our heads, but that we see the thrill of salvation and that you would continue to fill our hearts. As we look for this idea of of justice today, may we see what that means in terms of salvation. And so God, I pray that Uh, You would teach us, but that you would also change us, that we would look at something differently, that we would feel something differently, that we would end up behaving differently somehow as we take a look at this psalm today. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. For all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages and hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, You will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Well, we're not sure who wrote this psalm since there is no title, there is no caption to it like so many of the psalms have. And we don't know if it refers to a specific event or, as most scholars seem to think, that it's just a general frustration uh, expressing how the world seems to work. Like I said before, these are called imprecatory psalms. Imprecatory is not a word that we use very often. It it means to pray evil against or to invoke a curse upon. 
These kinds of psalms are difficult to interpret and sometimes they even provide us with questionable cries out for the wrath of God. There's other more um, graphic examples, Psalm 55, Psalm 69, 137, among others, call out for God to actually destroy people and do something about uh, the sin in the world. What are we to do with these psalms that don't seem to match up with the love for enemies that were taught elsewhere in Scripture? And so Psalm 10 that we're looking at today is honestly a relatively tame version of an imprecatory psalm, but one that is a good example. It builds on the emotions that we've seen thus far. We saw lament last week that there is something wrong with the world. And we saw in a praise song, God, if you're so awesome, why don't you do something about this? You kind of put those two ideas together and you get an imprecatory psalm. God, do something. And so let's look at this psalm in two parts. First, let's look at the first 11 verses and take a look at our wicked world. As we look at the first half of this psalm, the author paints a picture of what he sees happening in the world. Uh, we see so much of it that still happens today. Much of what the writer of this psalm describes is what we would call simply oppression, taking advantage of people for sinful motives. We see that everywhere today. We see landlords taking advantage of the poor, charging twice as much in rent for what it would cost to own the house, and then not fixing anything. We see corrupt politicians and leaders at all levels of government working only for their personal gain. We hear terrible stories of human trafficking where teens and children are taken for either prostitution or forced labor. We even see this kind of stuff happening close to home. Just a few years ago, police performed raids in Columbus and Worthington and Powell that found women being held in storefronts that barely spoke any English and were brought here against their will simply to service men's sexual desires or, or make their owners money. Ohio is now doing much better but has actually been as high as top five states for human trafficking in the last few decades. We hear stories from places like India where people have noticed that tourists are more likely to give money to children who are begging than adults, and even more to disabled children. So they begin using children for sympathy, even going so far as to purposely amputate limbs or disable children in other ways just so they can make more money off of their begging. We hear stories like this, and there's plenty of others, it should make us angry. It causes something in us to, to spark and we get anger. It isn't like a lament psalm where we're just kind of sad about things. We're mad. We're crying out for justice. We want to see justice in this world. Just like in this psalm, we see several factors at play even today. Primarily greed and pride. Whenever there is oppression, there is personal gain of some kind and the assumption that no one can do anything about it, especially God. In fact, according to the psalmist, these evildoers claim that there is no God that can do anything about this. Therefore, they can do whatever they want. I would say a quick aside, they are acting in a logically consistent manner. If, as so many people today believe that there is no God and we're just like the animals and we're just a, a, a collection of biological material, then by all means, do unto others before it is done unto you. Get ahead by any means necessary, even if you're doing what we all seem to agree is evil, just because you think there's no God. However, we know that isn't the case. We are not just animals. We're not just a collection of cells. We are made as human beings in the image of God. And we believe that those who are oppressed and exploited, those children who are born that are never even given a name, but are then used and abused for selfish purposes, we know that they are made in God's image, just like us. But these are the people who these, these evildoers prey on. Verse 9 in this psalm compares these kind of people to lions. If you've ever watched a, a nature documentary, who does the lion go for? The head of the herd? No, he goes for the weak one in the back. It's disturbing to watch, but that's exactly what's happening here. Oppression occurs whenever people in power, 
use those weaker than themselves for selfish gain. A better word for it might even be abuse. And it's happening all around us. Financial abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Anytime someone in power over another person uses that power to benefit themselves, we have oppression. That's what this psalmist is crying out for. Let's take a look again at these first 11 verses. Read them with me. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boast of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not see him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. So we know that the weak and the poor and the helpless have value in God's eyes and we know that He sees them being oppressed and abused. And so the anger begins to build in us because we see what greedy, proud people are doing and yet they seem to be succeeding. And like this psalm, we cry out to God for Him to do something. It is right for us to be angry when we look at the world, but it's not right for us to think that God won't do something. Let's look at the second half of this psalm in looking at our holy God. In verses 12 through the end of the psalm in verse 18. The point of this type of psalm is to recognize where the true power lies. It is good for us to desire to fight for justice in our world. We are called to do the opposite of these oppressive people. And instead of using the weak and helpless for our own personal gain, we must look after the rights of the widows and the orphans and the foreigners among us. It is good for us to form and support organizations to fight this, this oppression. It's good for us to have our community dinner and to support Pike Outreach and to look out for other organizations in our community to help relief efforts for the poor. And it's good for us to go on mission trips to help correct and fight social injustices. It's good for us to do all of that. And you should be involved in every effort you possibly can to bring justice Justice upon this world, but make no mistake, the power to overcome and end oppression does not lie in our efforts, but in the hand of our holy God. Our role in fighting injustice must also include calling out to God to do something whether that is by working through our meager efforts or by stepping in and pouring out His wrath on these wicked people. But it's also recognizing that even with all our anger and cries for justice, what we saw in Psalm 19 is still true. We serve an awesome, revealed, personal God. And as much as it appears sometimes that God is absent or God does not seem to care, our God is not impotent. Our God is not on vacation. He sees the oppressed. He sees the hurting. He sees more and understands more than we ever will. His holiness means that He is separate from us, that he, in His very nature, He must demand justice. It's funny that we cry out for such a thing when His very nature is where we learned that idea of justice. If we, in our sinful human hearts, can see an injustice, how much more can God see it? 
He will not allow any of this to go unpunished. It is right for us to cry out to God for justice. Listen to the rest of the psalm. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, You will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. To break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. The psalm has probably made you feel that righteous anger begin to well up and, and desirous of, of God's vengeance in our world. That's what an imprecatory psalm does. It sees what's happening and it doesn't just get sad like a lament psalm, but it cries out for God to do something, for, for God to, to, to pour out His wrath on these people doing such wickedness. But if we're honest, this is where imprecatory psalms present Christians with a little bit of a problem. While crying out for justice, we also begin to recognize our need for mercy in our own lives. Let's look at Psalm 14 to see the reason why. Psalm 14 is a lament psalm again, like we saw last week. But listen to these words as you continue to feel the righteous anger and the desire for God's vengeance upon our world. Listen to what David writes. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. We can join together and we can ask God to smite all evildoers, but with just a little bit of self-examination, we begin to see that that includes us. Perhaps the reason God doesn't directly and immediately answer our, our request, our demand for justice, is that because to do so would mean wiping out the entire world, including ourselves. It is easy for us to look at the stories of these evildoers from our day and declare, I'm not as guilty as they are. They do the really evil things. And we might not directly perpetrate the acts of slavery that we've heard about, but we do contribute to the systems that allow them to profit. We might appear to be kind, but really oppress others in, in ways that people around us can't see. Or maybe what most of us are guilty of is just being apathetic to the plight of the weak and the oppressed simply because our lives happen to be pretty comfortable right now. You see, we are guilty. We may appear less guilty than others, but our legal standing before a holy God is still guilty. When we cry out for justice, it is actually a cry against ourselves. So I pray that these psalms, these imprecatory psalms that cry out for God's justice in our world shake you out of your apathy for the hurting and the oppressed, but they also cause you to see that while you call for God's wrath, you also deserve to be the object of it. Yes, we need God to step into our world and do something. But at the same time, we desperately need His mercy in our lives because we are guilty too. Psalm 14 ends with this verse. I want to read this one from New Living Translation. It says, Who 
will come from Mount Zion to rescue Israel. When the Lord restores His people, Jacob will shout with joy and Israel will rejoice. And that's where I'll leave it for next week. A demand for God to do something that will judge evildoers and yet somehow show us mercy. A need for God to do something about this sinful and this broken world. And as the end of this Psalm 14 alludes to, and we'll see next week as we look at a messianic psalm, the answer is a person. God does pour out His wrath, not on this world, but on His own Son, thereby enabling Him to give us the mercy that we do not deserve. When we look at these psalms, we feel lament last week, sadness for what our world looks like. This week, an imprecatory psalm, we demand God's justice. Why aren't you doing something if, if you're an all-powerful God? And I think it's okay to feel both of those emotions, sadness and anger. And I think that's part of the thrill of salvation that we're looking at. We have to begin to see sin the way God sees sin. And that could, should cause sadness and anger in us. But as we do that, we also need to see that He's the one in control. He's the one that needs to do something. Let's close in a word of prayer as we respond in our hearts today, crying out for this justice, anxious to see from where it will come. Would you pray with me? God, forgive us for all the times that we have helped perpetrate injustice. We see it in our world all around us. We see corruption. We see greed. We see pride. And we can't stand it. God, we do pray with this psalmist that you would do something about it. But then we quickly recognize that we're in the same camp. As we're following this progression of what it feels like to, to, to come to a saving knowledge of you, this recognition of sin in the world points us at ourselves as well. And so please forgive us for where we've overlooked the hurting. Forgive us for where we ourselves have done such terrible things. But help us to see that it doesn't take these terrible things to separate us from a holy God. Our evil thoughts, our desires do that. And so God, we are all in need of you to act and to bring justice to this world somehow while showing us mercy. We thank you for Jesus Christ, and it's in His name that we pray, and amen. I want to close today with an old hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Some of you probably know it well. It was originally written by Martin Luther almost 500 years ago, and so Accordingly, it has some older language, some words that we don't use, but I think it still gives us a picture of God being the source of our protection in this evil world. And so I hope you enjoy this hymn as you listen. I hope you come back next week uh, to, to hear the hope that we have in the Messianic Psalm. And I hope that if there's anything that you need to follow up with, that you give us a call or you would contact us. Hope to see you back next week. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Thus ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Sabbath his name, from age to age the same.
and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undue us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The Prince of Darkness grim, we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gift are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever, His kingdom is forever, His